welcome. I'd like to really thank you for signing up for this exciting presentation tonight. I'm Patty Smith. I'm a naturalist educator at the Bonnie Vale Environmental Education Center. And for those of you who may be new to Beak, our home base is in West Brattleboro. We have a 200 year plus farmstead with a couple miles of trails. You're welcome to stroll on anytime. We offer natural history programming for the public, nature-based science education in all of the elementary schools, vacation day camps, teen naturalist outings, wildlife rehabilitation, and your membership and donations make all of this possible. I am so very pleased to have Sue Morris as the third presenter in our program series, Biodiversity and Climate Change, Two Crises, One Solution. <laughs> and uh, a sub theme of this is how new research is informing conservation. Sue is one of the pioneering naturalists whose work is shaping our understanding of the needs of wildlife and has created this one-time presentation to synthesize some of the groundbreaking discoveries from her own research and those of others. And I'd like to make a special appeal to you, dear audience, tonight to thank Sue for her Herculean work pulling this together. Uh, her funding sources love testimonials. So please, as you're watching, jot down some notes about what you learn and take a few minutes before you sign out to write something in the chat box that might let funders know how you feel about how important Sue's work is. And these thoughtful comments also support Bonnie Vale's work and the Northeast Wilderness Trust's work. So in advance, thank you. Beak's co-host this evening is an organization I'm very enthusiastic about, the Northeast Wilderness Trust, and here to represent Newt and introduce Susan Morse is Sophie Veltrup. Thank you so much, Patty. We're really excited to be doing this with Beak, um, good friends, partner organizations. Northeast Wilderness Trust uh, is a land trust. We work across New England and New York, and we protect forever wild landscapes where some of the creatures that you hear about tonight can find refuge, can find food, can find mates and shelter. And the idea is that wilderness protections will allow these places to grow older into complex habitat over time. So we really thank all of you for joining us to learn more about these special creatures and for your support in protecting wild landscapes. It is my delight to introduce to you Susan Morse. Susan Morse is an ecologist, professional wildlife tracker, educator, and published author. She is the founder and science director of Keeping Track, a nonprofit that serves to engage communities in monitoring wildlife and their habitats. Teams that Sue has trained have conserved more than 40,000 acres of land throughout North America. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Well, well, Needless to say, I am extremely uh, grateful and, and proud to be guests of, of both Patty and Sophie and Northeast Wilderness Trust today. This is a long show and um, for me, uh, a, a really lovely opportunity to, to do a little bit more deep thinking than I'm accustomed to doing on some of these programs. Usually I, I teach a lot about uh, habitat uses and ecology and and tracks and sign, of course. But uh, I think you'll recognize as we cruise along through this show that it's it's a mix. It's a mix of new information that I've discovered in my work as a field ecologist, but also some profound new information that others uh, are, are finding out about as well. And um, I think in the end, we'll all appreciate where this, this uh, really should be going. So enough said. So, to start and put us in the mood, animals that we have not known, which is kind of a twist on Ernest Thompson Seton's notion that we have known these animals and that all these decades of knowing them and managing them the way we have, we do indeed know them. Well, indeed, we don't. <laughs> so, quote, the Wolverine is a tremendous character a personality of unmeasured force, courage, and achievement, so enveloped in a mist of legend, superstition, idolatry, fear, and hatred, that one scarcely knows how to begin or what to accept as fact. Well, Seton wrote that, so 
bravo to him because that's about what one needs to realize with Wolverine. We haven't known this animal. So this is going to be one of several critters we'll be thinking about today. And this program is made possible with some grant monies from the Roberta Summers Memorial Fund. She was on our staff for many years and we mourn her loss, but she lives on in the animals that she worked so hard to protect and nurture. Thank you, Bobby. All right, so we know about red fox, don't we? Everybody has a red fox in the backyard or the back field, behind the farm, behind the barn. But what do we really know? Well, we know that for the most part here in New England, they're red. They may be brick red, they may be golden red, but they always have a white tipped tail and they usually have black stockings. But how many of us know that there are other color morphs, as we call it, or phases of red fox that are totally different? This is a color morph of red fox in New Brunswick that's called a cross fox. It has a black cross crossing its back and wither line. It still has a white tipped tail though, doesn't it? And the black stockings, but this is a red fox. And no, it's not a cross between a red fox and a great fox. It's just plain a red fox. And mother red fox could have all of these color phases in a single litter. This is a black red fox, or in this case, silver because of the white tipped silver tipped hairs. I filmed this in the Ungava Peninsula in Quebec. We know that foxes are out there in the fields pouncing and running and listening intently for small wee beasties under the snowpack. And we know they're very adept at making those precise pounces at times to get the prey that they're seeking and notice the tail sticking out of the mouth of that fox. She snagged her prey and as my mother would say, down the hatch. <laughs> but how many of us really know new information that's helped us appreciate that foxes and coyotes and fishers and all the predators out there, the hawks, the owls, they're critically important for keeping small mammal numbers down, rodents in particular, that in turn are reservoirs, you know, for Lyme disease. How many of us know that? So we really need these animals helping to keep these populations in check because that's the balance that might better be had. These are deer ticks on the back of a white-tailed ear. Oh, how about the Arctic fox? Not at all related to red fox at all up there in the Arctic, although increasingly we're seeing red fox all over the Arctic, so they're moving and climate change is certainly a part of that phenomenon but they're really a northern fox. They're up there where it could be 55, 60 below zero in the gale force wind. They're following polar bears on the pack ice and eating their leftovers. They are all about the Arctic. I took this picture in the Ngava Peninsula. They're scavengers for sure. This car uh, caribou was killed by wolves, but this fox is all about the leftovers, but they eat all sorts of things. Uh, ptarmigan, which is what we see here, uh, and, and a really critical food source for them uh, in the summer, uh, in spring and summer, but especially early summer and spring, uh, are the uh, seabird colonies and the cliffs uh, overlooking places like Hudson's Bay, where thousands and thousands, uncounted thousands of birds come to lay their eggs. And the foxes are all about sneaking about trying to get those eggs. And when they find one, they go and bury it and they come back for more. And when the birds leave the cliffs and endeavor to fly out to the ocean with their parents, I'm thinking in particular of the thick billed mirror, for example, or guillemots, the not all those chicks make it, you know, fledglings we should call them. And so the foxes are there for the not so soft landing. They eat a lot of lemmings as we see here. They eat, uh, in this case, what I call the belted Galloway bunnies. These are Arctic hares hiding because there's not a tree to be had. So, you know, Arctic foxes are all over the place. But here's something we didn't really know, at least until relatively recently. 
that from the air you can see ancestral arctic fox dens because they're brightly colored their their vegetation is lusher they have more texture there's willows and things growing there where there isn't in the adjacent tundra what's going on well the accumulated chemistry of the feces and urine and leftover prey items have over decades of time fertilized the place isn't that cool that's a arctic fox track and it resembles our red fox track uh, the, mid, the whole middle section of that track is full of fur, and indeed it is. So in many ways they're similar, but Arctic fox is smaller than red fox. Now shifting, shifting dogs, if we will, our eastern coyote should not be called east coy wolf or coy dog. It's really taxonomically recognized to be a coyote, and it's believed to have come across uh, North America uh, in response to the persecution campaigns that drove it eastward up into Ontario where it hybridized with a Canadian wolf called the Eastern Canadian a timber wolf or Canadian wolf. And so that's why our coyotes here, especially in Northern New England, are heavier, thicker, broader chests, broader muzzles, um, definitely different dentition. They're more wolf-like. Their teeth are definitely more wolf-like. So it's really remarkable. Not at all like their diminutive cousins in Arizona, for example, or the Midwest where they originated in the plains. Not at all like these smaller versions of coyotes. They're bigger by, you know, they're bigger by 10, 15 percent. Um, record weight coyotes have tip the scales at over, over 70 pounds, but that's not common. And they are all about this new world that they've discovered, and they're extremely bright. They're considered to be one of the most adaptive, bright mammals on the planet. And they deserve our respect and our, our nurturing. They need, to be, they need to be protected from that small segment of the human society that would cause them harm. Most of us don't feel that way. And we've got to stand up and be counted because our culture has got to make it illegal to be evil and nasty. There you go. Coyotes aren't evil and nasty as it turns out. This is dad. He's all over it. The baby is wanting to have a little hot lunch program so it's licking the muzzle to try and get him to regurgitate. And now it comes. I wasn't quick enough with a camera to capture the. <laughs> but you can see that pup's just wondering, Dad, you expect me to eat that? Eat they do. And uh, for this sort of thing, they get blamed again and again for every dead deer that's found in the woods. They're the cause. And that's utterly not true. And many dead deer that I find in the woods died of mortality associated with with other things, um, you know, being wounded by a hunter and not recovered or being hit by a truck on the dirt road nearby or, or starving, okay? And so those animals will be consumed by coyotes. This is a frozen carcass. But what I'm wanting you to notice here is something that I learned about that we didn't know about. We didn't understand this. And this is important as we seek to identify, did a coyote kill this or was this killed by a cougar? All right, well, notice that section of hide with the hair still attached that's being torn off in the mouth of this coyote. Because of their long pointed muzzles and their powerful bite force, they're capable of doing something a cat can't do, per my hypothesis. They can reach in and take a strong pinch of hide and flesh and pull back with tremendous force and create what I call a hair hide, a hair wad, excuse me. And so what that is, is it's, it's a section of the hair that's come off, but it's attached to flesh. Cats don't really do that. Now, shifting gears, coyotes eat everything. So forget the notion that they're out there looking for a deer every day, because they're not. Most of what I see in coyote feces throughout the year, except winter, comes from plants seeds, nuts, fruit, of course, all manner of fruit. 
Oh, that, by the way, is, uh, I believe, Red Delicious. Those are apple, apple remains. This must be Golden Delicious. And this is the best world-class coyote scat I ever found on the California coast. And if Bird Lochte is watching, this is for you. I found this uh, south of Eureka in Humboldt County. And um, this coyote had had exoskeleton fragments of crab. Those are the pink, crunchy things. Uh, portions of plums, those are the seeds on the right. And uh, the baggie by the knife where it meets the handle is from somebody's lunch, apparently. I did find remains of a vole in this feces. But what amazed me was there was a Granny Smith apple that came through. Now, I did not detect a fine Cabernet Sauvignon wine. I didn't, I, though I was in California and I expected to find that, I, I didn't find the evidence of that. They love life and they deserve our respect. Enough said. Here's an animal that's misunderstood. And again, what do we really know about bears? Are they really dangerous? Well, they certainly can be. They're big and they've got the equipment to really deal us a hard blow. But instinctively, they're scared of us. They are timid. These are the words I would use to describe the black bear. Part of that is the bear, the black bear, has evolved in a world of trees where it can run away from enemies including us. So trees are their escape route. So they don't really want to confront us. If they come to do that, it's because they've acquired some bad habits. And more often than not, we cause those habits to happen. Incidentally, you can see uh, the top of her head or the hairs are erected. That's, uh, that's a sign that she's really frightened. She's just gotten my scent. She doesn't like it. Now, the trees are important security habitat for them. And so most of the time we'll see evidence of trees being used as what we call refuge trees, where mother will shoo the babies up the trees and then run away and decoy the enemy out of there. But I discovered trees that I call babysitter trees. And these trees are totally different. They're used every year. And this is one. And so every year, some female with new cubs, i.e. cubs that were born to her in January, come to this tree and several others in the vicinity and park their babies up there. And so for 45 years, I've collected data on this tree, several others, plus some additional trees uh, out west in places like Montana and Arizona. The uh, field marks of a tree like this is that they have a ladder-like spacing of big, massive branches for the cubs to grasp onto, help pull themselves up, and then rest on when they get there. And they're safe up there from enemies. And mother goes away, she's going to feed in the nearby wetland or seepage area for food, and she can ill afford to have her babies at her side. When she comes back, however, she'll oof, 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 and they'll come down and she will nurse them. And that reunion is something that just burns into their little brains as the ultimate in comfort and safety. And for the rest of their lives, they will associate that with big trees. Black bears come in many colors, as you see here. This is a cinnamon phased black bear in Montana. Now, here is the new bell ringing concept that I'm marveling about in recent years with my uh, increasing deployment of remote cameras. Uh, I don't have the budget for remote video cameras. I wish I did. But lo and behold, I'm learning that not just the mother and her new cubs of the years are coming to these places, but other bears are as well. So there's a kind of society of bears that feel comfortable in one another's presence. Now, we haven't been told that. We've been told that male bears in particular mean those cubs harm. They better not come anywhere near those cubs. That's why those trees are important. Well, I don't know. So you're going to see here that there's a variety of bears that show up. Here he is scent marking a tree. There she is at a nearby additional babysitter tree. There's another female. Well, there you go. So this is flooring me because I'm realizing that there's far more sociability, if you will, in these bears, far more tolerance of one another, uh, far less overt 
opportunities for what we call infanticide and destruction of the cubs. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking we need to think about this. And I really would welcome hearing from some graduate students with lots of money and time to help uh, flesh this out. And so when bears rub on the trees, like those smaller trees in the vicinity of babysitter trees, they're communicating. They're commuting their identity and their reproductive status. And in the case of mother, her status with cubs of the year. And we can see the hairs that are still stuck to the sappy bark of that tree, that fir tree. So scent marking for me uh, in my work uh, has become a key. It's a key. It's, it's a way that I can really gain a lot of knowledge about what animals are doing without having to touch them, without having to put a collar on them or any of those things. Oh, but you know, we live in a complicated world and there's this thing called management. And increasingly we're told that bears need to be managed. They need to be hunted and sometimes really just flat out kill, gotten off, gotten rid of, because the human carrying capacity, as it is said, won't accept them. And I think that's wrong-minded, and I think we need to revisit that subject. First of all, we're not managing bears by killing them. We may be managing our concerns about what bears do to us, but to me, that that's that's not that's not an option. It's up to us to manage ourselves and manage how we handle what it is that's causing the bears to cause harm to our crops or to come to our back porches after bird food and pet food, et cetera, et cetera. I think citizens really need to know this. We don't just not know wildlife. We, we don't really know how we're managing wildlife. And do we really want that? And what are our choices? And how can we change that? Bears are all about food. They have to get a whole year's worth of food eaten in seven months. It starts here in the spring, in the wetlands, all that greening sedge. And then with the fruits and the nuts, you all know about that. Most of what a bear eats comes from plants. And when a bear does all that, it plants more. So a bear is really a kind of ecosystem engineer. It really influences, uh, it really influences everything for everything out there. How's that for a phrase? Everything for everything out there. <laughs> now, why is this not? I didn't touch that, did I? Okay, so shifting to another animal that's misunderstood, certainly not uh, known very comfortably by a lot of people. This is one, not a cat. It is, in fact, a fisher, but not a cat. It's a member of the weasel family, and it's not mean and evil and nasty. Cousin to the wolverine, it is a tough ombre, to be sure, and pound for pound, it's got a lot of strength, and I would say a lot of determination. That's the, that's the word I would use for this one. The fisher is determined to eat, to travel its habitat, to survive, to raise a family. That sounds good to me. They're beautiful animals and uh, they're very adept at climbing. You notice those cat-like claws. They're very curious and I've rehabilitated uh, two fishers in, Back in the days when I was doing that, uh, sub permanent here in Vermont, uh, ex extremely bright. Now, this is something I learned that we didn't know about. I call these stumps, these durable stumps with sharp pointed tops, I call them pokey uppies. <laughs> <laughs> and what they are are scent marking stations that fishers use year round. Here's a female fisher. She's on a pokeyuppie and she's scent marking it by rubbing her stomach, her genitals, her genitals, her nether end, as I call it. Uh, she may urinate on it. She may defecate beside it. She's all over it. Here's a tree that has a branch that sticks out from the root system. That's a lovely pokeyuppie. So one of the things that's going on, and later on you'll see why I'm showing you this, is 
part of what fishers are trying to do, per my hypothesis, is to get their hind feet, the surfaces of their hind feet, to rub on those pokey uppies. And uh, that's leaving scent. There's glands. And even under a snowpack with a pokey uppy completely buried in snow, my research has taught me the fishers know exactly where they are and they're going to go there, period. That's what she's doing. She's gone to the pokey uppy. She's opened it up. And here's one that was just opened up and my friend Matt Schlein of director of uh, the Willowell uh, Walden project uh, is, is enjoying uh, the wonderful, wonderful energy of that moment. Pokey uppies will have urine on them sometimes, uh, feces around them or on them sometimes. Uh, but mostly, as you see here, the feet seem to be what wants to be engaged on that. And there's why. Those four wart-like protuberances, which really aren't protuberances, they're really reservoirs on the surface of the plantar pad glands, they're marking that stuff. And when a fisher marks with his or her scent or various bouquet of scents, they're communicating all manner of information about their social and sexual status and their occupancy of their habitat, where and when. They eat all kinds of things. They're scavengers. In the case of this fisher that was eating a, uh, a bird that wasn't recovered by a bird hunter, Maganzer. And I know that for a fact because it had uh, it, it had been mortally wounded. You know, there's a lot of talk about how fishers are after three things in life. Your house cat, uh, porcupines, and deer. And all of this is utterly false. Yes, they will take a very occasional house cat. And yes, they have been known to visit deer that have died out there. Whether or not they actually killed the deer is anybody's guess. But if you are a squirrel, you better watch your back. According to my research, the number one prey item I see in fisher scats throughout the growing season, uh, throughout the year, really, even winter, uh, is squirrel. Red squirrel, gray squirrel, even flying squirrel. That's a squirrel tooth in a fisher scat. Holy cow. They eat a lot of fruit and they don't get any credit for this. So this is one of those things we don't really know about fishers, how much they contribute to biodiversity out there just simply because of all the seeds they eat and pass on in their feces, ready to germinate and happen. And this is something I learned and I've seen it again and again, but this is my best photograph. They will cache their prey items, the heavier ones up trees, sort of like African leopards. And this is a fox carcass. I think this car fox might have even died of old age or something, but that fisher, which was a female, carried that way up in that hemlock tree and uh, cached it there. And her den tree was right north, next door. So it was like having Hannaford's across the street. She didn't have to go far to eat and provide for her new young that were sequestered within her dendron. We all know that cats like cover. And as cover has changed in our New England forests uh, and, and Canada too, and certainly New York State as well, cover has changed because our forests have changed. We cut them all down and now they're regrowing and there are different age classes of forests out there. So what does that mean for an animal like a bobcat? Well, when I first started studying bobcats at Wolf Run 45 years ago, it meant young forests, thickets, brushy habitats, lots of snowshoe hares, and grouse. Well, that sounds like a plan. Sounds like a perfect bobcat diet. But as the forest has grown since then, it's, it's different. Are bobcats disappearing because of that? Well, snowshoe hares are definitely nowhere near as numerous as numerous as they used to be, nor are grouse, but there are other things out there that are keeping the bobcats in my study area very much alive. For one thing, the nearby farm edge habitats are proving to be increasingly valuable to bobcats because, how can I say it? They're no longer being shot on sight. They were in the 70s, they were bounty. So when I first was studying bobcats, they were being shot on sight. So they were very cryptic. They were not hanging around the edges of our towns and farms. They didn't dare. 
So that's opening up a world of opportunity for foods for bobcats. And yeah, they can now in my maturing woods find animals that weren't there years ago, like gray squirrel and turkey. Okay, so that's making up for some of those uh, snowshoe hare and grouse. They're in the wetlands that are now flooded by beavers and what's in there for them? They don't mind getting in the water. This, this bobcat is hunting a muskrat. They like the edge habitats where the acorns drop down from the oaks and the turkeys are nearby. They're very aware of those opportunities. At the same time, they'll come to the edge of our, our increasingly more temperate habitats, much more so than when I first moved to Wolf Run. We have cottontails now. We never had cottontails, not in our woods, but in our open fields. So bobcats are aware of that. I had a bobcat track cross right in front of my outhouse this winter and sat under a spruce tree waiting for one of my cotton trails to make a stupid mistake. Yes, they can and do prey on deer, but not as much as they used to. For one thing, winters are easier, so we don't quite have the same level of deer mortality in most of our woods as we used to. This is obviously be not true in the Northeast Kingdom or Northern Maine, for example, but uh, by and large, bobcats have so much to choose from. When they do kill a deer, they make a killing bite to the throat. And here again, remember the coyote with the hair hanks? Well, this is what cats do. Cats reach and grab the hair that they want to get rid of, and they bite it off without any flesh. And they use their incisor teeth to do that. So this is a newly opened feeding hole with hair hanks that are being held in my friend's hand. There's no flesh attached, so it's not what I call a hair wad. It's a hair hank. They really need their security habitat, and that much has not changed uh, in all the years I've been studying bobcats. They really, really, in New England, really like these inaccessible, cliffy, rocky uh, terrain. And they can ill afford to be confronted by us. And since COVID has hit, you know, we're all just anxious to get out there and love the land and be out there. And I certainly applaud that. But I must say, I'm very, very worried about impacts to wildlife. I really think each and every one of our communities needs to decide where our recreational activities can happen without harming wildlife and where we will agree once and for all to stay out. Wildlife need their refugia. They don't need to be constantly confronted by us. It is disastrous to a mother bobcat with newborn kids, disastrous to her with somewhat older kittens. She never knows what's around the bed, and it costs a lot of energy. Okay, we're moving on here. How are we doing with time? Yeah, just five after six. So we have until when? Uh, until seven. Oh, good. All right. We're doing good. So lynx, here's an animal that we certainly didn't know much about. When I first started getting involved with lynx, um, around 2000, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had decreed that the lynx in the lower 48 shall be listed as threatened uh, where it is protected under the Endangered Species Act. And I was certainly one of the champions of that uh, effort. And I served on a committee out west called the Western Forest Carnivores Committee. And all my colleagues out there kind of thought I was an oddity because, you know, we didn't have any links in the East. I don't know. They closed their eyes and they pictured all New York City or something. I don't know what they pictured. They had no clue about what the Northeast is like. I knew that we had links because I'm a deer hunter. And when I go deer hunting in Maine, I found links tracks. And for that matter, when I go up to Maine for other purposes. So shortly after the, the listing, uh, Maine's Fish and Wildlife Department decided to do some research and find out once and for all what's going on in Maine. Well, just a handful of years later, uh, the cumulative uh, impact of their radio telemetry studies had us appreciate most wonderfully, I might add, the reality that Maine not only had lynx, but it had the largest breeding population in the lower 48. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So what are they like? Well, they've got that black tip tail, that solid black tip tail is a giveaway. And from the hawk on the back leg down to the foot, it's going to be uh, reddish tan or tan or silver tan, but never dark. And then those ear tufts. I mean, they're ginormous. Look at them. So the black tip tail, the color of the leg from the hawk down to the foot is, is, is tannish or reddish tan or silver tan and those ginormous ear tufts. Here's the bobcat for comparison, white on the tail. And if you could see that uh, leg, it's darker. It's like a chocolate gray or uh, silver gray. Lynx have what I call bedroom slippers for feet. So unlike cousin bobcat, they're really all about deep snow. Those feet are really de facto snowshoes and the fur between the toe pads really uh, sort of reminds me of the decade on our snowmobiles, our, our snowshoes. <laughs> and this is something I discovered. Again, we didn't know it. Maybe, maybe Alice Murray discovered it, although he didn't draw it in his wonderful book on tracking. So I'm curious about that. But what I discovered was lynx feet are totally different than all other cats I've ever seen. They have tiny little toes at the top of the foot and a tiny little boomerang shaped pad at the bottom. And then the entire middle is without any pad at all, it's full of fur. So feet make tracks. The track on the right is a lynx track. The tracks on the left are bobcat tracks. So they're very different. Cougars would look just like the bobcat, only bigger. House cats would look just like the bobcat, only a lot smaller. So what is it about the lynx foot? Well, it's about those snowshoes and it's about what they have to do in order to catch a hare. They have to leap when the bunny leaps, they have to turn and zig and zag. And so those hind feet, which interestingly enough, my research taught us are bigger than the front feet, actually help the animal pull that off. They're boreal forest animals and here in the Northeast, we would expect to find them in, in the land of spruce and fir and birch and deep snow and deep cold. Land that wouldn't necessarily be good for bobcat because the snow would be too deep, wouldn't be good for fisher because the snow would be too deep and have the wrong consistency for fisher locomotion. So Martin and Lynx really like that deep snowed habitat. What climate change will mean for that is anybody's guess. But so far, we're having plenty of snow up in the North Woods. So we'll have to hope for the best. But it really has to do with all year. What, what, what is this habitat like all year? Well, one thing that lynx need is habitat to be full of snowshoe hair. Because unlike bobcat, they're, they're specialists. They're really relying on snowshoe hair. As much as 75% of their diet is snowshoe hair. It's kind of boring. <laughs> so they like spruce and fir and birch and thick, thick stands and thick stands of vegetation in and amongst these open glades. And that's what hair like, and hence that's what lynx like. At the same time, my colleagues in the West, myself included, have looked at optimal lynx habitat in the West, and here we appreciate that they like old forests, mature forests, wildernesses full of coarse woody debris and uh, piles of, of logs, and the more complicated, the better. And this is uh, optimal denning habitat for female lynx. Snowshoe hares are key though. Without them, lynx are not gonna persist. When we have great numbers of hares on the landscape, we have healthy, uh, a healthy production of kittens that survive. When we have a habitat like we do in parts of Maine and parts of Southern Canada, where depending on which way you go up or down the mountain, you, you could get into habitat where you might have some fisher in the mix. Fisher are definitely an enemy to lakes. And I was invited to come up to Maine to help them sort out this sort of uh, who done it here. What killed this female lynx? And uh, here's what I'm showing. I'm showing that this female lynx, I've inverted the hide so you can actually see the flesh from the inside out. And you see the holes that were created by the teeth of, of this male fisher. 
shifting gears, here's another animal we utterly haven't learned everything we need to know about, and hence our management has been, I'm afraid, horribly misled. The cougar, puma, catamount, uh, mountain lion, puma, panther, all names for the same animal. Did we know, for example, that here in the East, when we had uh, our original populations of cougars in, inhabiting all of this land that we live in today, um, they played a key role in, as, as did wolves, in keeping beavers and porcupines in check. Or at least that's what we believe. Who would have thought? They're just big mice with a flat tail. And yes, they do kill deer. They're programmed. They're hardwired. They're deer predators, really, is what they are. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're going to kill every deer that's out there, because if that were true, that would have happened a long time ago, and neither deer nor puma would be around. Here's that hair hanging that I was telling you about. This puma is cutting with the incisor teeth hairs away from the hide. They don't want to eat that. That is just ucky stuff. What they want to do is bald the hide, and I'll show you that in a minute. So here's a hair hank about ready to be expelled from the mouth. No flesh, just the hair. And this is what they look like. It looks just like something on the barber shop floor. They've been cut. And, and they stay together as a unit, curiously, I think because they were wet, wetted in the mouth. I don't know. But that's a balded hide. And it would be at this point that the cougar can then turn its face on the side and use the carnassal teeth to actually cut into that hide. Remember, it doesn't have that long nose for that, for that pinching bite. It's got to cut with the cheek teeth and make that circle, which will then insert its face to get into the meat. Shifting gears, we, you know, we didn't know much. We didn't even know we had panthers in Florida until relatively recently and, uh, you know, several decades ago, actually, but still in the, in the scheme of things recently. And it wasn't until biologists were looking at the genetics of these animals that they realized that what was going on in part was not only were they struggling with decreasing habitat in which to be safe, um, and find adequate prey, but they were struggling with being inbred. And so kittens like these were being born with heart murmurs and birth defects and reduced uh, sperm motility and reduced resistance to infectious disease. And so they brought into Florida eight Texas female cougars and let them be bred in the wild by Florida panther males. And overnight, the bottlenecking ill effects of genetic um, isolation uh, pretty much went away. Now, one would argue that this has got to keep going on and we have to really be careful in the future to, to maintain that uh, genetic diversity. But the good news is Florida, Florida's wildlife managers, Florida's hunters, Florida's citizens, Florida's cool school children, and I will say most importantly, uh, while Florida's uh, NGO leaders uh, of organizations like Defenders of Wildlife did an amazing job of promoting the need to care for and love and secure the future for this animal. So overnight, its condition really improved and let that be a lesson to us. But you know what? It's not over yet. Because even though pumas now, panthers we call them in Florida, are crossing the Caloosahatchee River, which used to be a barrier, and they're trying to get north, ah, oh boy, there's problems. They want to build more roads. There's going to be more uh, car panthers being killed on roads. I mean, they want to build one right through panther habitat. You, you Google that, and you find out. And, and if you are as incensed as I am, I hope you'll contact your representatives and let them know. This should not be allowed. They should not be allowed to go into Big Cypress, which is Puma Refuge, and mine for anything. Oil, I don't care what's there. Leave it alone. Okay, I'm going to be on the cougar subject here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to widen the view a little bit. And I'm going to have us think about the similarity of the plight of the puma, which I will describe in a few minutes, 
with the plight of the African lion. And this is a quote from one of my favorite books uh, called The Last Lions by Derek and Beverly Joubert. And listen to this, this is pretty powerful. In many ways, this story seems symbolic of all lions. When Beverly and I were born in the mid 20th century, actual numbers of lions were sketchy at best, but some researchers placed them at around 450,000. Now this is African lions now. Today, or at least by 2002, the best assembled and official international union for conservation of nature number was 23,000. Our investigations indicate that lions have not been doing well since then. And even if we liberally project that curve to today, it is unlikely that the number of lions in the wild is more than 20,000. These animals are on the brink of collapse and their decline, I'm sad to say, happened on our watch. It happened while we were filming and writing books on lions, while our generation got entangled in endless debates about whether hunting was good or bad for conservation, rather to allow elephant hunting or culling. And while we were wasting thousands of man hours on talk fests about conservation, we carry the full burden of responsibility for the damaged environment that hangs in tatters around us today. Lions are just one of the casualties of our arrogance and lack of attention. In case I never get another chance, I apologize on everyone's behalf. Well, I'm bringing that up because our lion here in North America is the same animal. And the same thing is happening and it's being called management. We're using hunting as a management tool to so-called manage the big bad predator to safeguard our sheep and our cattle and our, our whatever. And so hunting is regarded as an important tool in managing the numbers of the species, just like the African lion. We need to manage the lion and we might monetize the lion so that the villagers will be happy. But the bottom line is the African lion population has plummeted 95% in the last 50 years. I don't call that management, I call it a massacre. And that's what's happening today, I'm afraid, in our own country. We don't know about this animal at all. We've just recently learned, thanks to Mark Elbrock's work, that lions actually exist in groups that have interactions with one another. Who would have thought? They're supposed to be loners. They don't tolerate one another. Well, that's not true. I'm quoting Mark here. Many researchers believe that animals lack the cognitive, cognitive capacity for recalling experiences and strategic thinking required to exhibit reciprocity. Think about that for a minute. That's pretty arrogant. And later on, we'll learn about kinship groups, the same animal with Jeff Copeland and his work with wolverines. These animals have societies, if you will. They have socialization with one another. They have reciprocity. They have sharing. Wow. More on that later. Back to killing them. In some states, like South Dakota, they're killing females. They don't have enough toms to go around, and the hunters need to be able to kill them, so let's kill some females. Well, 75% of all the adult females out there are either pregnant or caring for their young. Think about that. So she doesn't come home, then what? We, we have too much impact on wild nature. And E.O. Wilson said it best. The living world is in desperate condition, it is suffering steep declines in all the levels of its, body, its diversity. Only a major shift in moral reasoning with greater commitment given to the rest of life can we meet this greatest challenge of the century. Wildlands are our birthplace. So here's Sue Morse's solution to all this. The wildlands that are out there now, the vastness of the Arctic, the vastness of the jungles, there's just so many places, including our wild oceans, we need to immediately put aside half of them, just like Dr. Wilson 
proposed. Only uh, a, a measure as, as big as the magnitude of the problem that we have created will make enough of a difference. And hunting is just a tiny piece of the big picture. And the big picture should feature us thinking very differently about our actions and what's appropriate out there. It's not appropriate that, you know, 50 kittens a year in Wyoming are orphaned because hunters are killing their mothers. Thriving predators require thriving prey. Our game management system is nicely geared to produce hooved animals in good numbers, but primarily for human consumers. Devised during the first half of the 20th century, it's a semi-agricultural approach that openly defines wild herbivores in terms of crops, harvests, and surpluses. A primary goal is to provide what managers call the maximum sustained yield. Well, I'm gonna go on record. I'm a hunter and in, you know, I've taken deer, I've taken elk, caribou. I am not ashamed of that at all, but I am ashamed of this principle. It, it's just totally inappropriate and we've got to stop it. And the only way we can stop it is if citizens like us stand up to be counted, period. Yeah, animals die out there. There is such a thing as mortality, but hunting is not gonna somehow magically compensate for natural mortality. It doesn't work that way. And we don't know all the other ways in which animals do die out there, nor are we counting. How could we possibly know how many elk perish in a 10 day blizzard? How many? Who's counting? Nobody's counting the heads, by the way, of the lions in Africa, which is why they're in the predicament they're in. Who's counting this animal? You know he's not going to ever stand up again. It would be most merciful if he could be eaten by cougars and wolves. And he will be. Okay, thinking positively here, I want to say that there is hope and there are things going on out there that... Um, really should inspire us as we look for ways to make a difference in our communities and in our country and in our world. For one thing, my, my colleague, George Schaller told me years ago when I was just a pup, he said, Sue, wild cats are amazingly resilient. All we've got to do is stop killing them. Well, lo and behold, jaguars are taking up residence in parts of the Southwest. And I was, part of a team that proved that. Now, we don't know that we have a lot of going, going on in the way of population building, but we have evidence. This cat was caught on a remote camera. They invited me to come and help them figure out how to get more pictures. And I told them to find scent marking stations because that's my specialty, like this big mesquite tree. And a month or so later, this is what they got. Guess what? with or without his sombrero, if he's just visiting from Mexico and not really living part of the time in the United States, why is he showing up at the same tree on the same trail again and again? So it's really exciting. And this is the country. So what do we do as citizens? Well, the first thing we do is we get together with our fish and wildlife agencies and our NGOs, and we form a massive coalition to save land to save it as wild and to save it as working, to save it all. Because if we fill this full of roads and houses, it's over. Same thing, since I first started doing research in the Huachuca Mountains, which I did for over 20 years tracking mountain lions and bobcats and bears, I couldn't have known that just five years after I stopped working on the project that both jaguar and ocelot would show up, wow. So it's about the land, it's about keeping it whole. These caribou that go from winter range to summer range, they cover hundreds and hundreds of miles, thousands in some cases. These are the caribou in Quebec swimming across the George River. They're special, they embody their landscape and we, we 
of our culture, if I can take some liberties here, those of us who are not First Nations people anyway, we have no clue. I mean, you know, the mindset of the average European that came here was that the, the Arctic was a wasteland. It was called barren. Nothing lived there. Well, nothing could be more wrong. And this is uh, from Ted Carasotti's Blood Ties. In fact, most of us can't even imagine that this continent, so seemingly blank when Europeans arrived, had already been explored and populated, and that nearly every ridge, valley, swamp, every peninsula, beach, and cove where people live, gave birth to children, hunted, gathered plants, and died, had been named with affection, with humor, and in memory of hard times. It wasn't a wilderness when Europeans first sighted. It was home to a multitude of peoples, and I would add a multitude of fellow living beings. And yes, it was wilderness, and that's what made it so good. So this has really been a proving ground for me to see in a truly wild, bigger than big setting, literally across from from uh, Labrador all the way to the Arctic National Refuge in Alaska with 11 different caribou herds. What's it like to see a big place? But even this is at risk if we're not careful, but certainly at risk with climate change. What then? Your feet are beautifully designed for pawing through the snow looking for lichens beautifully designed for running, which they do a lot of. And traveling thousands of miles. And it's a glorious world because as you can see here, if you get down on your hands and knees, there's a lot of beauty to behold. This is a gentian, a pale gentian. And these are the famous plants that caribou depend on females, especially in the Arctic National Refuge. Cotton grass blooms that are so nutritious for lactating new mothers. This is cotton grass later in the season, hence the name. They're remarkable animals. No two are the same. You may have a herd of thousands pass you in the course of a day. There are no two are the same. Wooly lousewort, they eat that like ice cream. If they see one of those, they go straight to it. This is one in full bloom. So every place, every habitat, every animal is a world. And it really demands that we immediately act to secure that world, to protect it, largely from us. And that means staying out. Uh, these First Nations women who were volunteering on a caribou uh, guardian project in British Columbia, when asked what was really going to stick with them after all those winter days watching caribou, one woman said, watching the girls, their faces, seeing their vulnerability, and knowing I am part of that. This is the vulnerability. The sea ice doesn't form on time. So caribou that have to migrate across from the landmass in Victoria to the mainland, they can't leave on time. They can't come back on time. It's a mess. They drown. It's hard on mothers. It's hard on their offspring. These are healthy caribou in, in, the, in the mountains of... Uh, the Mackenzie, the Mackenzie mountain caribou, they're called. This is the Mackenzie River. It doesn't get any better than that. But you know what? Climate change is dictating that this place is too daggone hot. And caribou are really struggling with that. They don't do heat. They're like our moose. They're not about getting overheated. And so all the snow mount pack that used to reside in the big cirques up high in the mountains are gone. There's no snow up there anymore. Look how skinny she is. Well, is that all? No, if she's skinny like that, she's probably not gonna concede. You do that too many years in a row and the game is over. Caribou will decline and that's what's happening across the world. Insect, 
persecution of the highest order. These are warble flies. They're pustules of maggots on the backs of these animals. And these animals have to endure way more of this sort of thing because of a warming climate. <laughs> Seeking snow for relief. <coughs> they need their security habitat in the winter. <coughs> Excuse me. They do not need to be confronted by us. No snowmobiles, no logging roads, <coughs> just wilderness. Cover. They don't need a road like this one. This is on the way to the Quebec Hydro you know, dams, multiple dams. And these roads are a menace. And the energy these animals have to expend is off the charts. Well, if you're going to survive, you don't want to waste energy. See, animals know that. We don't. Animals know that the best way to get through life is to save energy, not use it. Maybe they don't know that. But if they don't know that, they don't live long. Musk oxen, same thing. Nowadays, musk oxen are run down by snowmobiles. You know, people who are hunting musk oxen use snowmobiles. That's just not right. That's not management. That's got to be stopped. It's one thing to use a snow machine to get across, you know, 100 miles of tundra, but you park that machine and you you stalk and you hike in. Don't you dare use that machine to run those animals. And so many, many animals die out there. People don't know. They don't know this. They don't know that they're trashing these animals' energy budget. All right, so as we wind up the show, that's a scent marking of a musk oxen horn by wolves. And wolves are much misunderstood and you all know that so i'm probably going to have a little less to say about wolves than some of these other critters but some of the work that's being done the books that are being written are are really uh amazing glimpses into the lives of wolves wolf tracks but again management dictates that we we Get rid of wolves if we we suspect that they're going to kill off our caribou because after all, they're the problem. It's never us. Same thing with the gray wolf, and you know we dance that, that dance all the time. The lower forty-eight. Are they really a menace? Are they really going to kill every cow and sheep out there? These, by the way, are the different colors of gray wolf, even black. And then this is the Arctic wolf up north. And this is the red wolf. And when I visited red wolf country in the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, this was one of the things I got to see. There is such hatred there for the wolf and for that matter, the coyote, that uh, it's really an embarrassment and a tragedy. This is our eastern wolf in Canada. This is the wolf that hybridized with the coyote that created our coyote. They eat all sorts of things. They don't just go out and eat, you know, a deer or a wolf or a caribou, a uh, moose or a caribou. They're, as you see, eat small mammals, even small predators. Their sociability, their they're working together, their cooperation, their devotion to one another, their society is flawless. It works for them, but it doesn't work if we start popping them off and changing the dynamics of who's in charge and how the pack will find enough to eat and find the leadership it needs, raise those pups. Polar bears are like the poster child of climate change. We all know that. It's a struggle. 
the sea ice is definitely disappearing at an alarming rate. That's a polar bear front foot track next to my boot. You know, just to give you a sense of the fragileness of the sea ice in places, it's just unbelievable. And so dents, that polar bear dents that are on land in the sea ice where the permafrost is melting and the banks of the edges of the land are sloughing off and falling into the ocean. It's a disaster. This is a whale carcass and these bears are enjoying the benefits of some leftover bowhead whale that the villagers in a village called Kaktolvik gave them. They have permission to hunt uh, bowheads for subsistence and ceremony. And so they reverently provide a lot of biomass of leftover foods for the bears, which they enjoy knowing are thriving as a consequence. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is doing DNA research by setting up these barbed wires so they can catch some hares and learn more about just how far bears go on the sea ice. They're not just they're not just out there 20 miles. They're all over the place. And what we're now learning is that, gee whiz, they're not just going to wait and die of starvation because they're not going to be able to get enough seals hunting on the sea ice. Some bears have taken to hunting seabird egg colonies and um, and berries and, and fish. So things that, you know, we didn't used to think polar bears wanted to eat are showing up in their diets in greater and greater numbers. So this is a gigantic polar bear feces next to my boot. And it is full. All those little shiny copper colored things are crowberry seeds. And then the bigger red ones are mountain cranberry. Their claws are interesting. They're very bear-like, like, uh, excuse me, very black bear-like. This is something I discovered. Although the new hybrids that are happening involving polar bears hybridizing with brown bears, creating what is called grizzly, uh, pizzly bears or growler bears, their claws are curiously still more black bear-like, although they are somewhat longer and stouter. This is a pizzly bear, a naturally occurring hybrid. And that's a polar bear frightened to death. That bear ran by me at 100 yards, not because I was causing him any harm, but because he had been chased earlier by a snowmobile, a native, you know, a native community, probably 20 miles from there, uh, was hunting snow, uh, bears with snowmobiles. So in a way, it's about money. It's about all the stuff we want, all the resources. And at what point are we just going to say, we're going to live and let live? So I'm going to end with a critter that really embodies what we don't know about wildlife. Everybody's sure that the wolverine is mean and nasty and vicious. The bad name these animals enjoys rests not so much on the actual damage they inflict on man, but rather on the fact that they are so difficult to catch or kill, for we detest what we cannot subdue. So this is a trapper's cache. So they certainly detested the idea that a wolverine would come and get into their food or get into their pelts. And understandably, it was, it was hard. There's no doubt about it. Wolverines are incalculably strong, powerful animals running up and down these mountains like no tomorrow. I highly recommend a book by Douglas Chadwick called The Wolverine Way. You'll never be the same. It's a great book. Beautiful, beautiful book. Well written. And that man loves wolverines. They're all over these mountains. The colder, the more snow, the better. Avalanche shoots, victims are buried deep in that snow and female wolverines know where that is and that's good. That's all good. And even historically, the native cultures, the First Nations cultures had a thing about wolverines. 
and this is from a book called Shadows of the Coy Hook. A hunter or trapper carrying a wolverine home would sing something like, a rich person is coming to the house. A good blanket was spread on the floor next to the wall of the house or tent, and the wolverine was placed in a sitting position, its back propped up against the wall. Each person who visited the house placed a small food item near the wolverine. The wolverine was to be well treated and not offended in any way. Wow. She's wearing a wolverine, a neck warmer. She's Inuit from Northern Canada. Wolverines have an amazing ability to take the most used up, uninteresting prey animal that died out there of starvation or froze or didn't get finished by grizzly bears or wolves and the wolverine can take care of business. It can eat all of that. Not a problem. It's got bolt colors for teeth. There is no other animal with the jaw force that they have. And so it can crush the really big bones to get to the marrow, which is a great source of nutrients. Yum, yum. It can literally not only get to the marrow, but it can, it can eat the bones at some point. It will bury the bones and come back for them if it needs to. Does a lot of that sort of thing. And they manage to extract nutrition from, like I say, the absolute total leftovers. At the same time that they're powerfully strong and mysterious, they're amazingly fun-loving and full of joie de vie. This one did a somersault right in front of me. There you go. Burp. <laughs> and uh, Chadwick and his colleagues on the Glacier Study had, had, had reports of Wolverine fun out there. They really don't tolerate being hunted because when we kill them, like the cougars and the African lions and others and the wolves, we mess up their social structure. What do you mean social structure? They're loners, right? No, they're not loners. They, they have a social structure that involves them sharing. And I will conclude by just giving you one image. Females, maybe three, sharing the home range of a male will raise his offspring. And when they leave her, guess what they do? They go visit dad. We didn't know any of that. There is a wonderful system of reciprocity and sharing and cooperation. And that what that does is it allows those young wolverines from a couple of different litters an opportunity to keep on learning, keep on growing, keep on getting strong, and keep knowing their habitat longer in safety while they grow. Now, isn't that something we want for our kids? We should be more like Wolverines. Enough said. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. <sighs> that was just so amazing. I'm especially fascinated by those wolverines. <laughs> and uh, we have some time for a question and answer. And I'll just put in a little reminder right now again for some great testimonial uh, material in the chat. And I see we've got some good stuff coming in here. Um, but for questions, <laughs> yes, Sue, how do you spell pokey uppy? <laughs> oh, I, 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 I don't know. I'm not, I'm not even sure I'm consistent in that, but P O K I E dash uppy. <laughs> but, but, you know what? You can check Northern Woodlands magazine, which I highly recommend. And I write for them and I've described pokey uppies in, in articles in the article. So see how I do it there. I don't, uh, I'm afraid I don't know, but spell it phonetically. It's good enough. Maybe it'll be a real word someday, but I love that. Spell. Um, so we do have time for some Q&A um, and I can kick it off with a first question. 
Um, we have a question from Corey here who's wondering whether there are other animals that also create hair hanks like cougars, or is that very specific to cougars? Well, as I said, bobcats will do it and cougars will do it. And I assume that if I got to see uh, hair hangs from a lynx, I mean, lynx have been known to take, you know, reindeer and Eurasia and, and, and caribou calves here. So that might, might happen, but bears and, and coyotes and wolves will do it a little bit at first when they first start working over the kill, okay. but it quickly shifts because they have that long muzzle and that bite power. Okay. And so, and then what you really see, which which I want to emphasize, is the distinction between a hair hank and a hair wad is there's wad, there's flesh attached. And that, I suppose it could happen occasionally with a cougar, but it's on average, it just doesn't. It's, okay. it's more what, what the other animals do. Okay. Yeah. Virginia would like to know if bobcats eat beavers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I once tracked a female bobcat in my study area who uh, nailed a, a beaver that was out trying to forage in the middle of the winter on the ice. It was a desperate situation. And um, the cat, which had to have been outweighed by the beaver, had to turn around backwards and with the beaver in her mouth, pushing with her front feet and walking backwards with her hind feet as she dragged the beaver off the open ice to the edge of the woods because cats are driven to eat in cover. They don't like to eat in the open because their hard won meal will be quickly discovered by scavenger birds and other mammals. So they're, you know, they, they're hardwired to get that prey hidden while, while they eat. So that's amazing. That seems like a big feat for a bobcat. Yeah. They well, are something. No, they, yeah, she was determined. It was a good deal for her. Yeah. <laughs> worth, worth the effort. Mm -hmm. So we've got another question from Elizabeth, who's wondering if there's a science, any kind of scientific technique where we can analyze scents that are left behind by bears and other scent marking animals to identify specific individuals. If there is, I'm not aware of it. I am not a, a chemist. Uh, I did have some interactions at one point with one chemist from Scandinavia, I think it was, it was several years ago, because he was trying to develop what he called felonine, which was artificial cat urine. And they were presumably trying to develop that for the gardening market so that you could post that scent around and prevent your garden from being marauded by deer. And uh, so he was very much looking at the chemistry of at least of the urine based scent. Um, but I, I, that's just not an area. I'm more of a behavior person and, mm -hmm. and what, you know, how that, is. where that also happens, because I'm also an ecologist and I'm looking at features and habitat that seem to elicit that behavior. Mm -hmm. What, you know, where do you, it's like us, where do you put the garage sale sign? Do you hang it on the garage or do you go down to the intersection of the nearest? Yeah big confluence of roads. Right, stuff. and I think about like dogs in an urban environment sniffing the fire hydrant yeah, and like yeah. that, that yeah. kind of mimics yeah. the, the sticking up log or yeah. what's something that's really obvious in the environment. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think one generalization I'm comfortable making is that these animals want their scent marking station to be conspicuous in some way. It can be olfactorily, conspicuous because it's a conifer tree that's been raked open and the sap jumps out or it's a pupped telephone pole that has creosos deep within it that gets released when it's opened up or you know bobcats want a scent station to be visually conspicuous slightly mounded but then olfactorily helpful because all that all that is absorbent materials hold on to that scent and deliver it over time mm -hmm. so, it's, just, it's all cool. And yeah. with the obviousness, that's why you call it in your Facebook, right? Yeah, in your Facebook. For social media <laughs> Thank broadcasting. You. Thank you for remembering that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do fishers fish? You oh. know, fishers are so, so resourceful and so, um, full of mystery, I wouldn't doubt it for a minute that if they found a, a maroon school of something in the shallows that in a really dry summer got stuck there, they'd go for it. Why not? You know, but uh, we know wolverines have been known to do that. 
and and you know even go after frogs things like that so i i wouldn't put anything past the fisher frankly i really wouldn't i don't yeah. think the name fisher has more to do with french canadian bastardization of the word for polecat so when they saw the fisher in canada they called it fichette and at least that's what we're told anyway that's that's soon um, morphed into fisher but I had always wondered why I got that name because I didn't think of them as primarily fish yeah. predators. That's so interesting. There's an excellent book on the Fisher called The Fisher by Roger Powell. And he's a well-known, very respected biologist. And it was published, I think, by Cor Cornell University Press. It's still in print. You should definitely check that book out. It's excellent. Great. We can include that in the resources. And I think earlier, another question we have is, um, whether a puma is a lion, I think maybe earlier, did you, what, were you meaning like it's a mountain lion? Yeah, the, the, yes. The, the official accepted common name for mountain lion is puma, puma kunkel. Okay. Then there's mountain lion, then there's cougar, then there's catamount, which is what they were called here in our mm -hmm. region. Then there's panther, which is what they call in the Southeast, especially Florida. There's a bastardization of panther called painter, you know. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, and then when I when I was involved in doing a little unofficial research, looking at movement corridors from between Zion Park and some of the adjoining foothills, I worked with some houndsmen there who were deer souls, and they were great, and they called them deer slaying soul bitch. <laughs> But they did that just to yank my chain because they knew I loved them and they did too. Yeah. Uh, do we have wolves in Vermont or just the offspring of wolves and coyotes? Well, we have the we have a new variety of coyote that is officially taxonomically recognized as a coyote, not a coy wolf and not a coy dog, although there are some dog and wolf genetics, obviously, in, in them. But I mean, there's dog genetics and wolves in the middle of the Arctic, probably dating back to the movement of dogs from Eurasia to, you know, to this region for, for transport and stuff. So dogs have been in the Arctic, you know, messing around with wolves. At least that's the theory anyway. Um, so all those names are names for the same animal. They're just used in different regions according to custom and so on great and then hopping back to bears do you know how long polar bears and grizzly bears have been crossing to make a growler slash pizzly bear i don't know of the exact answer to that because I, I haven't studied that but i know that the, the the animal that i photographed was in was in a village up in victoria island uh called a uh, and it had been killed by my guide. So he was a he was a native that I came to know in the village and really respect. He's a great guy. And I mean, that's just their custom. And he had never seen anything like that before or since. And uh, it, they do exist out there uh, and, and presumably may exist more and more. I mean, the original polar bear has only been around 150,000 years and it evolved oh, from the brown bear. So that yeah. is not that long. No, I had no idea. So I, again, polar bears are not a species I've studied in any detail at all, other than to read some of the technical literature. And mm -hmm. I've been there though, and I've seen their habitat and I, I, I really gotten a very personal feel for the dilemma they're in for sure i am not seeing any more questions in here are you no. sophie lots of great I comments i see one more oh. came for one more question yeah of course. okay rachel asked um is there any food animals or plant that no animal at all touches that's like totally off the menu for any animal out there, like something that might be poisonous or just disgusting or too spiky. Oh, you mean you mean a plant? A, an oh. animal or a plant. Hmm. Boy, I, I'd have to say, uh, again, that's an angle on life I haven't pursued. Yeah. 
It's interesting though. Yeah, I wonder if, like poison ivy comes to mind. Oh no, well, poison ivy berries. That's how it gets around. The birds eat the berries. Oh wow, oh, yeah. didn't know that. And they cool. probably, probably are dealing with poison yeah. ivy. Yeah, oh, that's so you interesting. Know, I don't know, that's an interesting question. I, um, I'm always amazed when I'm in the field and I find fisher scat with porcupine quills in it that went through somehow, some way. Amazing. And came out without, you know, putting 50 holes in the colon. I don't know. Yeah. That's something to survive. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, we've got some and more questions. Fishers aren't alone in taking porcupines. I, me I mentioned earlier that, that pumas or cougars here, catamounts, we will call them here, I regularly ate beavers and porcupines. And when I've studied them out west, I, I've noted the occasional presence of porcupine. Um, not so much quills in the scat, but small, finer hair like porcupine hairs. Yeah. And definitely found, I actually have a really cool picture I took of a porcupine carcass that was completely inverted with its back to the ground and its legs out like this and it had been eaten from the stomach in, just like a fisher really wow. way. And very meticulously consumed by a puma. Cool. There were no fishers where I was. I was in Utah. That's so. impressive. Oh, now the questions are pouring in. Uh, let's see. Oh, last catamount sighting in Vermont. Oh, you know, you could get that in the history books in the 1800s, I think it was, uh, 1880s, I guess, in Barnard, Vermont. A good source of a uh, story on that would be Charles Johnson's book called The Nature of Vermont. He actually has a picture of that stuffed cat in the book and so on. Um, but, you know, I'm always a little leery of those last and first, you know, stories because I remember all too vividly how it was just flatly dismissed among a whole bunch of scientists, except for one, Gary Kohler of Washington State. But everybody else was sure that there weren't links here in the East. <laughs> you know, and Gary Kohler, he nailed it. He said, yeah, you have great habitat for links there. Why doesn't anybody say that? You have the vastest vastest terrain of suitable habitat and connectivity be between Canada and the United States. Uh, I forget exactly how he put it, but he's a great scientist. Yeah. And do lynx come into Vermont at all? Yeah, well, we actually have proof of, of, of females with kittens and, you know, pictures that people have taken themselves and also remote camera pictures of, of lynx in, uh, you know, Nolligan Basin and, you know, uh, Silvio Conte in Northeast Kingdom, generally. I, when I was on the sort of the edge of the whole lynx business in Maine, and I visited the project a couple of times as a guest researcher, I remember saying to them that I had seen lynx tracks in a place called the Hard Scrabble, which is south of Jackman. And at that time, the core area where all the lynx research was going on and the confirmations was well north and, and uh, east of that and, you know, up towards the Allagash in that country. So, you know, people didn't doubt me because they know that I'm a track. Well, since then, you know, we do know that, and, you know, there, there's spotted occurrence of lynx all over. I think it, well, it is recently as the mid 2000s, they, they estimated the population as being somewhere around a thousand animals, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and, pretty cool. you know, connectivity between Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire is key. And mm -hmm. there's where conservation planners and conservation advocates, both, all of us, need to work together, public and private. It's not yeah. just for the officials. It's not just for government. I really, really am a believer in the citizens. The citizens have to get involved in this. Yeah. If, if I can share about a Northeast, recent Northeast Wilderness Trust project, um, which was in partnership with Forest Society of Maine, so slightly different conservation approaches, but we worked together um, to conserve a total of 20,000 acres oh, yeah. in that exact right where Maine meets New Hampshire in right. the Western Maine mountains. Um, 
and about 15,000 of those are conserved with the Forest Society of Maine easement. So forest is managed and harvested in that part. And then about 6,000 of those acres are conserved with Northeast Wilderness Trust as huh. forever wild. So you've got that partnership aspect. And then all of that is only possible because people like you all in the audience support places like Northeast Wilderness Trust and Bonnyville Environmental Center and keeping track yep. and continue that education and community. Well, one thing they recognize in Maine that's going to be important for Lynx in, in the future is to somehow maintain uh, through both management, active forest management on the one hand, and wildlands conservation and older forests on the other, is to maintain a mix mm -hmm. of the qualities of habitat that we know are needed by both hare and lynx. Mm -hmm. And and then how will that how will that be tweaked over time as the climate moderates, as snow consistency and depth changes as you know uh, spruce budworm is around the corner what's that going to do that's what spurred the last big push of habitat for lakes the spruce budworm burm, worm episodes I, I guess the 80s 90s and then the clear cuts that happened to salvage that mm -hmm. material left these early successional habitats mm -hmm. and these young forest habitats that blossomed by by the time you got into the early 2000s into phenomenal lynx foraging and denning habitat mm -hmm. they even proved that the denning habitat was was working here in the east in young forest habitat you know 10 15 20 year old thickets of spruce and fir providing there was some coarse woody debris mm -hmm. that that could be the magnet for mother lakes and their little ones and i've seen some of those dens that's kind of cool that's very cool so you know we i'm a big believer in a mix and i think mm -hmm. i think that's why northeast Wilderness trust is is a great organization as i see because you do too yeah yeah it's important it's important to us to partner with other conservation organizations that I'd, I'd much rather Vermont still have a forest industry than have a condominium industry. oh yeah <laughs> or a golf course and i'm sorry everybody i'm not really into golf but you know really <laughs> you don't want to play mini golf with me or maybe you do because then you'll win well, so no i don't think so <laughs> <That'd be good. laughs> I uh, I see we're we're reaching your time limit, so we have a couple more questions about fishers. Sure, no, I took up your time with extra time, so I'm delighted. I'm glad you're not all mad at me for being over the budget, but this oh. was a tough show. I don't think people in the audience realize that the two key technical people that I rely upon to build these shows both got COVID. So thanks to her, miraculous. I was miraculous. able at the last minute to, you know, I mean, I put it together conceptually and anyway, enough said. It's a last minute sprint and we're so happy to be here with yeah. you all tonight. Yeah. It's really yeah. a pleasure. So if there were a few rough Fisher, spots. Michael. Yeah, Fisher questions. Um, is it true fishers were reintroduced in Vermont to control, well, it says introduced to control porcupines and the follow up is uh, reintroduced in New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, but any more and was it to control porcupines. I'm not oh, going to answer the latter, although there are two resources I'll refer you to. Um, fishers in Vermont were never completely extirpated they were on their way out and it was a worrisome prospect for both officials in our forest and parks department and fish and wildlife department so they did a really cool thing they collaborated and they brought to vermont you know a number of live captured fishers from maine and maybe even the adirondacks and released them in what i vaguely recall 41 vermont towns and it was an overnight success i remember seeing those animals the very first sightings of those animals in the 70s was really quite exciting and the whole idea per who was then my boss ted walker uh, of, of forest and parks was was to to try to get back on the landscape a density of fishers that could be a natural control for porcupines because they were really um having too great an impact on 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 trees um 
So that's the story there. And I believe, but I, I'd want you to research this to be sure for yourselves. I believe that the natural movement of fishers into Massachusetts from Vermont uh, happened. Mm -hmm. I don't know how fishers got into the Adirondacks. So that's one you need to, to ask. Um, but there's some great publications on wildlife of, of New York State Adirondacks. So. And uh, the New York Conservationist, if you were to Google that and ask for history of fishers, maybe you could find a good article on that. I don't know. Great. And in terms of other resources, um, we had some folks asking about books for kids to spark a love and fascination with wildlife. Do you happen to have any recommendations for that? Hmm. Yeah. I, I do. If I were sitting in my library, I could pull some. So well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm yeah. going to pull a bunch of titles and get them to you. Great. And okay. for everybody in the audience, we'll send out an email um, within a week um it'll actually be before this weekend um that will include this recording and other resources that sue recommended in this presentation so we'll include some recommendations of children's books in there as well so keep an eye on your inbox um and that will be in your inbox before the weekend wow incredible well thank you patty for making this happen thank you for the wonderful theme uh, and, and thank you for not only helping me put this thing together, but hosting it. So thank you. Oh, thank this you, was you. so yeah. much fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Susan Mark, Morris thanks. and Sophie. All right, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for all of your great comments and enjoy the rest of this beautiful evening. <laughs>